Well, I'm going to start, even though people are queuing for tea, so I'm going to put all the attention on you guys. Um, <laughs> welcome, everybody, to the first All Souls talk of the final term of the year. And I'm very pleased today to be able to welcome Dr. Sharon Shalev in person, which is very exciting. Um, Sharon is an international expert on the uses and consequences of solitary confinement and other restrictive practices. She works as an independent consultant in the area of human rights and prisons and holds research associate positions with us at the Center for Criminology, as well as at the Mannheim Center for Criminology at the LSE. Sharon manages the website, which some of you will be familiar with, www.solitaryconfinement.org, and has published widely on the subject. Today, she'll be drawing on her work, including field research in New Zealand, England and Wales and the US, to reflect on some of the achievements and remaining challenges around the use and international regulation of solitary confinement practices over the last 30 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm feeling a bit strange being here with people. It's my first presentation in person. I've given a lot of those over the last two years. This is the first one in person. Um, and I feel we should just go and have some wine and <laughs> worry about it. But, Let's um, go. <laughs> But uh, here we are. So um, the last couple of years, you know, like most of us, I spent mostly staring at colleagues through a computer screen um, and experiencing a degree of social isolation. Um, oh, this doesn't work. Uh, what can you say now? Thank you. Um, so social isolation, physical separation from others in a small cell where one has reduced sensory stimulation and limited access to programs and activities and a near complete dependency on prison staff for the provision of one's basic needs from toilet paper to food to healthcare and access to a telephone to news about the outside world. These are all um, main characteristics of solitary confinement the focus of my work over the last 30 years or so. I thought the toilet paper would be a, a good image to have now behind me. <laughs> now, you'll find solitary confinement cells and rooms in most closed institutions, including prisons, psychiatric hospitals, police detention, jails, and immigration detention facilities all over the world. In prisons, the focus of my talk today, solitary confinement cells are where those undergoing coercive interrogation will be housed and the cells to which they will be returned once the interrogation is over. It is where, in countries still practicing the death penalty, people awaiting execution will typically be held, and where spies and enemies of the state may spend years and decades. It is where prisoners who committed an offense in prison or broke a prison rule will serve the punishment of being banished from the prison society, usually as a short but hard punishment. It is where those considered to be too dangerous to themselves or to others, too troublesome or too mentally unwell will be housed. I should add to this list, as we've learned yesterday, that it is where those suspected of radicalizing others will be held to prevent them from spreading their ideology. Now, although solitary confinement is almost always proposed as an individualized response to individual failings, dangerousness, unwellness, vulnerability, otherness, the demographics of those most frequently isolated hint at structural issues and the further criminalization of poverty, ethnicity, trauma and addiction, and gender, as I will demonstrate later. Solitary confinement is also a common response to emergency situations, real and manufactured. Whatever the emergency, solitary confinement is the prison's default response. Staff shortages, prison unrest, political unrest, hurricanes, wars, and indeed pandemics, as we saw when COVID broke, and entire prison systems went into lockdown, essentially solitary confinement, where prisoners were held in single cells. The tension in the room is palatable. <laughs> <laughs> and solitary confinement is very harmful. It attacks the individual in two ways. It places them in a highly stressful condition, and it takes away the usual copy mechanisms, access to human company, nature, and things to do. Unsurprisingly, the documented adverse health effects of solitary confinement, as you can see, both 
physiological and psychological are very serious and wide ranging um, as the slide uh, demonstrates. Social isolation alone is now viewed as a major public hazard, which according to the author of a large scale US based study from 2017, so before the pandemic, could be a greater threat to public health and obesity in the US. Ironically, social withdrawal often follows isolation. People who have spent time, I was wondering, is it okay to say the F word? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Too late. Too late. <laughs> People who have spent time at uh, long periods in solitary confinement report feeling uncomfortable in social situations. And in this respect, solitary confinement can damage the individual's prospects of successful reintegration to the prison society or indeed free society going directly against one of the key objectives of imprisonment, as well as several international human rights law treaties. What I plan to do over the next uh, 45 minutes or so is to give you a whistle-stop tour of key developments, especially in the area of international human rights law, some reflections drawing on my own work in various jurisdictions on what still needs to change, and some thoughts on if and how we in academia can and should contribute to making change happen. This talk is based in part on an article I wrote for a special issue of the journal Torture, marking its 30th year, due to be published next month. So first, I'd like to take you back to March 2020 and the early days of the pandemic. I had the good fortune of being stuck in New Zealand. I say stuck, uh, in inverted commas, because being in New Zealand meant less exposure to the virus and a functioning government whose message to its citizens during the pandemic was be kind. I was very pleased to be one of the team of five million. And of course, New Zealand is stunning, has good quality food and excellent wine. And I've met some very good friends there. So being stuck in New Zealand was in many ways a lucky and happy experience. But the situation behind bars, especially in the country's solitary confinement units, was highly problematic, as I discovered when the New Zealand Human Rights Commission invited me to follow up my 2017 nationwide review of solitary confinement practices in the country. Many of uh, these are some of the key uh, issues I identified uh, repeatedly. Many of these issues remained unchanged since my initial 2017 review, despite promises of forthcoming change from the New Zealand Department of Corrections and despite an injection of money into mental health provision and the refit of some segregation units. The central message of my ensuing report was that a significant shift in the very way that detaining agencies think about the extreme tools of seclusion and restraint is needed for a meaningful change to be achieved. To keep the message simple, the report was accordingly titled Time for a Paradigm Shift. But the persistence of two issues alarmed me in particular, the punishment of race and gender and the intersection of race and gender as it manifested in women's prisons. I was therefore very pleased to be invited by the Human Rights Commission to pen another report focusing on women's prisons. Um, as you can see, I hope, um, the use of solitary confinement across New Zealand was high in the three women's prisons. Uh, they are in pink, and that was not my choice. It's a graphic designer. Uh, <laughs> but these are the women's prisons, and you can see uh, that, uh, well, the second highest in the country was a woman's prison. Um, and all three of them were um, in the first third, is it? Quarter? Anyway, hi there. Um, so the one with the 285 segregations per 100 prisoners uh, is Auckland Women's Prison, which is a prison for uh, women on remand. So, you know, some of them are still uh, innocent. Um, and within the three women's prison, the situation was particularly green for Maori women. Um, I'll explain this in a second, but just for context, Maori women are grossly overrepresented in New Zealand's prisons anyway. They make uh, up for only 8.3% of New Zealand's general population, but 63% of its prison population. And this gross overrepresentation becomes even worse in the harsher form of segregation management units, where Maori made 75% and Pacific Island women made up for 18%, with women from European origin making up only 4%. Um, just to very briefly explain, uh, management or control units is where people, women in this case, considered to be 
uh, consistently problematic, difficult to deal with, uh, will be held in solitary confinement. They have, I'll show you in a minute a slide, they have their own, their cells have their own yard, so they hardly uh, leave their cell area and the conditions are really unpleasant. Separates punishment unit, so someone, a woman breaks the prison rule, she will be placed in this punishment unit, supposedly for short time, but I found some women linguishing them for a very, very long time. And the ISU, uh, which is uh, for protecting women who are considered to be at risk of self-harm or suicide. So you take someone who is very vulnerable, feels dreadful, and you shove them in solitary confinement. Uh, again, I'll be talking about that more. But the interesting thing about this slide is that, um, as you can see, again, um, Maori uh, women are in the grey. Uh, the more punitive the unit, the more Maori women uh, are in there. And the only place where European women are, well, OK, uh, sort of same, 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 uh, same level really in separates and in the ICU. So women that are considered to be vulnerable, um, uh, white women that are considered to be vulnerable will be placed in an ISU, but not in the management unit. Um, I return to that. Um, of course, what this may indicate worryingly is that prison staff found it easier to see Maori as troublesome, high risk or dangerous, and white women as vulnerable. Now, as well as being banned up in their cell for upwards of 22 hours a day, women were subjected to an array of damaging and degrading practices including cell extractions, which is when two officers, sometimes three, sometimes four, just enter the cell unannounced, remove the woman from it, usually placing them in um, shackles, and conduct a thorough search. Um, I was also worried about lack of mental health care, invasion of privacy, and degrading rituals. The women were strip searched as a matter of course upon arrival at uh, the units, and periodically thereafter. Women who were admitted to the ICU, the Interventions and Support Unit, which is, as I said, the segregation unit for all intents and purposes, uh, were also required to wear an anti rig gown, and the cells were under constant CCTV surveillance. That's what the anti rig gown looks like. Uh, you're supposed to be naked underneath, and the idea is that A, you'll have nothing to harm yourself with, and B, that if they need to kind of access your body for medical procedure or whatever, if you self harm uh, they can do so quickly. They are very degrading. The women hated them, understandably. My analysis of unit records indicated that the gowns and strip searches were, unsurprisingly, often a source of conflict and grievance, as in the case of one woman who, on reception to the prison, was deemed to be at risk of self-harm. She was sent from the receiving office directly to the ISU, where she was subjected to a degradation ceremony straight out of Goffman, she was placed in a strip cell and told to remove her clothes. One of the four officers involved described what happened next. And this is uh, from the file. So this, these are the words of the officer. Upon arrival at the ISU, she became non-compliant and refused to take her clothes off and change into a gown. She finally removed her top and bra and put on the gown, but refused to move her pants. Staff instructed her to move from the strip room to her allocated cell. Once in the cell, I instructed her to remove her pants and underwear. She did so after much abuse towards staff. Her behavior became worse as she announced she had her period. When officer so-and-so instructed her to remove her hair tie, she stood in front of her and spat in her face. Spontaneous use of force was used and the hair tie was removed. I took her right arm, officer X had her left arm, officer Y took her head and officer Z had her legs as the prisoner was resisting. Staff exited the cell with no further issues. This incident involves four officers struggling with one woman, in this case, for the purpose of removing their hair tie, aggravating what was clearly an already tense situation. Other practices including frequent use of pepper, pepper spray against women inside their cell for the flimsiest of reasons, including, for example, and again, I quote, she threw her, her hat at the staff and attempted to grab at their hair, refused her medication and threw the container which contained her medication back at the nurse. It missed the nurse. These are all incidents that uh, led to the use of paper spray inside the woman's cell, yeah? Um, she proceeded to peel her orange and threw it at staff, threw a jacket at the nurse, threw a spoon at staff which landed at officer's staff-proof vest. 
threw a carton of rotten milk at staff, which landed on the front of one of their trousers. The prisoner claimed that the milk slipped. I would note that in men's prisons, incidents such as these would most likely not even be reported, let alone punished so harshly. My report from which these examples were taken is titled First Do No Harm, after one of the most fundamental principles in medical ethics, eating at the inadequacy of making statements about new ways of working and cultural and gender specific sensitivities whilst at the same time subjecting women to punishment and humiliation. Now I'm highlighting New Zealand because it's the last country that I visited and researched in depth. And because it's surprising, we somehow don't expect such practices to be prevalent in such a lovely and otherwise advanced country. But similar practices are widespread everywhere. And solitary confinement seems to be one of those practices that one would find in each and every country. And of course, the United States, and I expect this is less surprising, remains the firm world leader in its use of prolonged, strict and inflexible solitary confinement. The latest reliable estimate from Judith Resnick and colleagues at Yale University's Lehman project suggests that in the fall of 2018, some 61,000 people were isolated in prisons across the United States for longer than 15 days. Now remember this number, 15 days, I will return to it later. As you can see, well, it's not a great slide, but hopefully you can see, uh, 1,950 people were in isolation for more than six years, uh, 1,771 for three to six years and so on. So very long periods. Um, I'm sure that a lot of those people are still in isolation today, by the way. Um, many of those isolated in the United States will be held in one of the supermax prisons, which have proliferated across the country since the late 1990s. Each of these prisons holds several hundred human beings in conditions of strict and prolonged solitary confinement. Those confined in them will be held typically in for 23 plus hours a day in an eight by eight foot cage or metal box containing an open toilet basin combination, a concrete pit for a bed and a small concrete table stall unit like the cells. Um, cell. So this is in um, Arizona. That's the front of the cell and that's from inside the cell. Um, what else can I tell you about that? Uh, Obviously, they'll be separated from the world at large, as well as from their peers, and completely dependent on prison staff for the provision of all their daily needs. These massive isolation prisons lend themselves to horror stories from people literally boiling to death in the cell because there was no air conditioning, to people choking to death with no one noticing and remaining in their cell dead for days, to the many, many who seek a way out and self-harm or kill themselves, which is not easy to do in a supermax. But what I really want to mention here is the over-the-top and inflexible architectural design of supermax prisons. In one of the supermax prisons I visited, Pelican Bay in California, I counted 10 doors and gates from entering the prison site to the cell where the individual was locked, obviously behind steel doors and several locks. And the design is not only over-the-top, it's also inflexible. There are no spaces for congregated activities, and these are not offered anyway. The inflexibility means that even if there was political will to loosen up the controls a little, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to do so. Um, although uh, designers come up with also innovative solutions, so uh, that's a classroom still maintaining isolation, and this is group therapy. Again, uh, they can see the therapists, but they cannot see each other. These prisons are not places that are easy or cheap to repurpose as general population prisons, no ones in locations so tempting to property developers as Holloway Prison in North London. Architecture and economics mean that, particularly in the USA, despite a small reduction in recent years, around 2% reduction, mass solitary confinement is likely to continue, whatever good intentions to the contrary for the foreseeable future. Okay, now that I'm around the third uh, through my talk, maybe a bit late in the day, I should set out um, how solitary confinement is actually defined, as promised in the title of my talk. Uh, why am I showing you 18th century? Well, I guess just to kind of uh, show that there's been pretty much continuous use um, since the 18th century, and until very recently, there was no internationally agreed definition. Enter the United Nations standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners, 
adopted by the UN in 1957 and substantially revised in 2015 and renamed the Nelson Mandela Rules, including a definition and a new section dedicated entirely to solitary confinement. Now, this definition seems obvious, but one of the most persistent issues around the use of solitary confinement ever since its early days is what the practice should be called. Prison authorities in particular are not keen on the term solitary confinement, and throughout its long history, solitary confinement had been known by a variety of names, typically indicative of the purpose that the name giver wanted to ascribe to the unit. Intervention and support unit, special management unit, structured interventions unit, control unit, and so on. The physical space bearing all these different names, though, has changed very little throughout the decades. And there is a reason for this resistance to call a spade a spade. Renaming solitary confinement enables the name giver to distance themselves from the damages of solitary confinement and to present their solitary confinement-like practices to themselves and to others as something completely different. It also enables prison authorities to respond to legal challenges and judicial interventions, condemning their solitary confinement practices by saying that they no longer practice them, and therefore any criticism is no longer valid. A recent example of this is the introduction of the Structured Intervention Units in Canada in November 2019 as an alternative to the much criticized Administrative Segregation Units to resolve ongoing legal challenges to what practices amounted to solitary confinement. So to practices amounted to solitary confinement. Informed critics note, however, that the change of name and declared intentions have not in fact been reflected in any changing practices on the ground. An important aspect of the definition offered by the Nelson Mandela rules is the requirement for human contact afforded to people in solitary confinement to be meaningful. Now, the origins of the term meaningful human contact can be traced back to the Istanbul statement on the use and effects of solitary confinement, which Peter Schaaf Smith, a colleague, and I drafted back in, 20, in 2007. <laughs> Someone in the screen. <laughs> Maybe it's Peter Shaw Smith. <laughs> um, now, originally, we did not intend for the term meaningful human contact to define solitary confinement. Rather, we attempted to describe what solitary confinement looks like in practice, regardless of what it was called or the official reasons for its use. This is an important point because the term meaningful human contact, predictably, has proven to be very problematic. Um, this is uh, how the Istanbul, no, it is not. Yeah, this is how the Istanbul statement describes solitary confinement and meaningful human contact. Um, but in the Mandela rules, meaningful human contact becomes part of what distinguishes between permissible and prohibited practice. But the drafting of this rule is problematic because it suggests that so long as the isolated individual can enjoy some meaningful human contact, they are not in solitary confinement. Further, the term meaningful human contact has proven to be difficult to demonstrate or disprove. Even in jurisdictions keen to adhere to the Nelson Mandela rules, the term has led to what I can only describe as petty accountancy with prison authorities documenting every interaction, like I gave the prisoner his food three minutes. Literally, I've seen that in writing. Uh, in the hope that all these small interactions would amount to sufficient demonstrable meaningful human contact. To address this potential problem, the Essex Expert Group, which was convened for the purpose of providing guidance on the interpretation and implementation of the Mandela Rules, suggested that such interaction, meaningful interaction, requires the human contact to be face-to-face -face and direct, so without any physical barriers, and more than fleeting or incidental enabling empathetic interpersonal communication. Contact must not be limited to those interactions determined by prison routines or the course of criminal investigation or medical necessity. So giving someone their food is not sufficient in itself to be meaningful human contact. Okay, so this precludes utilitarian interactions, uh, like escorting a prisoner to the exercise yard, or as I said, giving them his food. Although these activities may well involve meaningful interaction, Indeed, some of the prisons uh, I visited, I found that the yard time is used by segregation unit staff, especially in this country, actually, to interact with segregated prisoners and try and kind of get a sense of their state of health and well-being. 
Whereas in other jurisdictions, the cells and yard doors, as I explained in the women's prison in um, New Zealand, for example, were operated remotely, they were attached to the cells, so there was no need for face-to-face -face interaction at all. But how do you measure and assess meaningful human contact? What constitutes meaningful human contact? How long does the contact have to last to be meaningful? Can remote communication, say via video conferencing, be considered as meaningful? Does the contact have to be with a human being? Who does it need to be meaningful to? And importantly, is meaningful human contact, whatever it is, sufficient to maintain the health and well-being of someone in solitary confinement? I think that these are all difficult questions, but that's not to say that human contact doesn't really matter. However hard it is to define, meaningful human contact is something that you recognize when you see it. I think that one of the positive findings of a large-scale study of segregation units in England and Wales that I conducted with the Prison Reform Trust in 2015 uh, was the quality, in many cases, of the staff-prisoner relationship. We've got some examples here of uh, how uh, prisoners spoke about staff and how staff spoke about prisoners. Um, the vast majority, 89% of prisoners we interviewed, said that there were some uh, segregation staff with whom they got along well, and 57% of segregation, segregated prisoners felt that officers were supportive. But in the context of relationships which are more than simply instrumental, it was clear from our study that solitary confinement was nonetheless taking a heavy toll on prisoners, and to some degree on prison staff as well, but they are not the subject of my talk today. Um, the second question raised by the Nelson Mandela rules definition is whether there is an acceptable duration of solitary confinement, and if so, what it is. The Mandela rule set a time frame for the practice to fall under the definition of solitary confinement at 22 hours or more a day. But this definition raises some issues. First, it focuses the mind on this artificial cutoff point of 22 hours rather than on the practice itself. Secondly, it calls into question practices that look and feel like solitary confinement but involve less than 22 hours a cell. Where do you draw the line? 21 and a half hours, 21 and three quarters hours, it's a tricky one. Third, this definition does not allow for nuance, reflecting the fact that different individuals re react differently to solitary confinement and that some are more susceptible to its damages. And then there is a question of measuring psychological pain and who should be excluded from solitary confinement. Proponents of solitary confinement often attempt to demonstrate that its adverse effects are no worse than the pain of prison more generally, or in one case, suggesting that solitary confinement may even be beneficial to health. Others, for example, Ian O'Donnell in his excellent 2014 manuscript, Prisoners, Solitude and Time, point to those who survive long periods of solitary confinement, seemingly unscathed, and to the ability of the human spirit to thrive even in the darkest of places, as Derek Jeffries' 2013 book is titled. And whilst it's true that human beings can survive the most unimaginable experiences, it's appropriate that today's uh, International Holocaust Memorial Day, um, I think that we should be careful not to hold the strength of the human spirit as proof that locking up another human being in a small cell alone for weeks, months or years can be anything but painful and damaging. Recognizing the particular vulnerabilities of certain categories of people, Mandela Rule 45-2 stipulates that the imposition of solitary confinement should be prohibited in the case of people with mental or physical disabilities when their conditions would be exacerbated by such measures. The prohibition of the use of solitary confinement and similar measures in cases involving women and children. These prohibitions are based on the knowledge that the effects of solitary confinement on children, young people, people with disabilities and those who are mentally unwell can be particularly harmful. As you can see, this is also recognized by the World Medical Association. A US federal judge noted that prolonged solitary confinement in a supermax may press the outer bounds of what most humans can psychologically tolerate. And for those with pre-existing psychiatric disorders, it was the mental equivalent of putting an asthmatic in a place with little air to breathe. Another judge spoke of Texas's administrative segregation units as virtual incubators of psychosis seeding illness in otherwise healthy inmates. And with regard to children, a joint statement uh, from the British Medical Association, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, and the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health 
uh, asserted that was in June 2018, asserted that as children are still in the crucial stages of developing socially, psychologically, and neurologically, there are serious risks of solitary confinement causing long-term psychiatric and developmental harm, and calls for children and young people in detention to never be subjected to solitary confinement. Yet, children and young people are regularly and routinely isolated in prisons across the world. In Australia, for example, children as young as 15 were reportedly held in solitary confinement for long periods. Uh, an inspection report from England and Wales in 2019 made similar findings. Women, including mothers and pregnant women, are also routinely segregated. Um, the study, uh, my study of solitary confinement in women's prison in New Zealand, um, for example, found that despite being a highly vulnerable population with high levels of trauma and multiple and complex needs, women, mostly Maori, as I said, were segregated significantly more often than men, including some stays lasting several months. My research suggests that women may experience the pain of solitary confinement even more acutely than men, and the rate of self-harm in more segregated women was particularly high. People suffering mental illness are similarly placed in solitary confinement in prisons worldwide because there is no other institutional solution for them or because they disturb other prisoners in the prison's general population or because they are waiting for a bed in a psychiatric hospital. This is the case despite wide consensus that solitary confinement is very painful for people who are mentally unwell. Um, as I said before, Mandela Rule 45.2 excludes from solitary confinement people with disabilities where the conditions may would be exacerbated by such measures. But this, in my view, is problematic. Is it right to wait until someone who may have had no previous mental health issues develops a psychiatric disorder before asserting that they must not continue being subjected to a practice known to cause mental illness? I would have liked to see the Mandela Rule's mandated complete prohibition on the use of solitary confinement for people with mental illness, children, young people, and women. Another question raised by the Mandela Rules is who should review solitary confinement placements? Mandela Rule 45 requires for solitary confinement placements to be subject to independent review. But who is this independent reviewer, who they should be, and the degree of authority they have in the process remains open to national interpretation and application. International experience with various forms of independent reviews show that these often leave something to be desired. For example, in 2000, as part of efforts to limit the use of solitary confinement, Israel introduced a law requiring any extension of solitary confinement stay for longer than six months, yes, already six months, uh, to be authorized by a judge. However, an analysis that a colleague and I did of 354 court decisions made in the course of those 20 years found that whilst judges recognized the harm of partic and particular pains of solitary confinement, they nonetheless approved 93% of requests to extend stays, including very prolonged ones lasting several years. Uh, these are some uh, quotes from what the judges said. So, I mean, clearly they're very much aware of the harms of solitary confinement, but they managed to find a way to approve it nonetheless. The study suggested that structural factors and the use of techniques of neutralization and forms of denial allow judges to explain away the pains of solitary confinement and to diminish their own role in authorizing and inflicting these pains, potentially hampering their effectiveness as independent reviewers. Canada opted for a system of independent external decision makers for deciding on extended solitary confinement placements, but a study of the work of these um, independent external decision makers, i.e. DMs, I don't like acronyms, found that they approved the prison authorities' decisions in the vast majority, 87% of cases, so similar to what we found in Israel. Furthermore, an implementation advisory panel set up for the specific purpose of monitoring these newly set up structured intervention units was dissolved a year later, after it was, it was set up in 2019, was dissolved a year later because the Department of Corrections failed to allow members access to the units or to data, casting doubt on the utility of this form of independent review. So even given good access to prisons, prisoners and prison administrative records, an independent reviewer needs good knowledge and understanding of prison procedures and practices. They also need to maintain a relationship which is cooperative but not too close with prison staff, as well as gaining the trust of prisoners. This is not always an easy balance to achieve. Even when access is provided and a cordial distance is maintained, follow-up is often poor 
and adherence to recommendations difficult to monitor, as the Canadian experience demonstrates. Finally, there is the thorny question of what role physicians and other health professionals have in solitary confinement units. In many jurisdictions, a doctor or a nurse needs to sign a form asserting that the person is able to withstand isolation. Indeed, this is considered to be a safeguard against ill treatment. The Mandela rules attempt to walk a very tight rope between, on the one hand, the wish to ensure that detainees always have access to a doctor, and on the other hand, the ethical requirement for health professionals not to take part in practices which are not geared towards maintaining and improving their patient's health, and specifically not to participate in, assert in asserting their fitness for isolation. That's the Nelson Mandela rule. Um, as you can see, the Nelson Mandela rules make it clear the medical staff have an important role to play in safeguarding the well-being of prisoners who are isolated. But how is keeping a close eye different to certifying fitness for isolation? This is an unresolved and a very difficult issue. Excuse me. We must also not underestimate the pressure that health professionals can be under to adopt the narrative of prisoners' dangerousness and suspend their clinical judgment. Whilst we would not want to advocate less human contact, certainly not with a doctor, I think that we should be clear about what exactly is it that the health professionals are asked to do. <clears throat> and how does that square with a broader role to provide health care? It is important that doctors are associated with healing and cure and not seen as facilitators of ill treatment to those they assess as able to withstand it. <coughs> Excuse me. So, in conclusion, oh, just an explanation. That's a psychiatric uh, examination in a US supermax. Uh, as you can see, medical confidentiality very strictly adhered to. Not That's a restrained bed in Norway. Um, and this is just a locked door in segregation unit because often the uh, what the doctor or the nurse does is they stand at the door, kind of, you know, put their head in and say, are you OK? Prisoner says, I'm fine. And that is the extent of the um, thing. So I think that we're in a better place on solitary confinement than we were 30 years ago. Although, as Bronwyn Naylor and I argue in a recent article, Setting prohibition or requirements in international human rights law cannot produce respect for others or ensure the positive protection of human dignity. Trying to ascertain the meaning of meaningful human contact is also a powerful reminder of the limits of the law in prescribing the preferred quality of human relationships. The Nelson Mandela rules, despite their limitations, have done a great deal to raise awareness to the harms of solitary confinement and to the need to make this a tool of last resort. They have, at the very least, provided us with a useful tool with which to measure the failures of prison systems. There have also been some positive changes in practices on the ground. In the United States, the birthplace of prolonged solitary confinement for mass, where the, uh, excuse me, for mass warehousing of people in prison, there are signs that the tide of solitary confinement may have started turning. Several states have now successfully implemented significant reforms to their use of solitary confinement. Colorado, for example, banned the use of solitary confinement for longer than 15 days, as per the Mandela rules, and policy changes in North Dakota achieved a 74% reduction in the use of solitary confinement between 2016 and 2020, with no associated increase in prison misconduct. It is not clear to me that this progress will be sustained in the United States, and whether other countries will follow. But the very fact that the term solitary confinement is now widely used and associated with negative, painful practices is in itself an achievement and a cultural hope. But we should do more than simply hope. Further progress needs the application of academic rigor and activism, an understanding of the deeper structures and themes at play, and a refusal to just take the easy answers or accept that what is said by prison authorities and administrators reflects practices in this deep and far end of prison system. A readiness to shine a light on these dark corners. Solitary confinement is a deeply destructive prison practice. I hope that one day it will be abolished. Until that time, I believe that it is important to work with governments and prison authorities to try and achieve reform from within. To try and change practices, even if in small ways, 
anyone working in and with prisons will tell you that it's the small things that matter most. And nowhere is that more obvious than in solitary confinement units where people are already only provided with a very bare minimum. Some colleagues of mine believe that we must not change the system at the margins and make it more tolerable, but rather strive for nothing short of abolishing prisons. As an activist criminologist, I believe that we, for the sake of those languishing in solitary confinement cells around the world, cannot afford the purity of shouting at the margins. I think that we need to keep pressing for solitary confinement abuse less and with more humanity along the way to the ultimate goal of its abolition. I'd be very keen to hear your views on the role we should properly play. Thank you.